We're in a series uh, called Bringing Hope to I Will. And what we're doing in this series is looking at seven action steps that we can take to help bring the hope of Jesus to the world. I mean, that's where our hope really is, right? It's not in a politician or political. It's in Jesus. That's, that's the hope of the world. So if we could bring that hope to people, that's, that's the supreme hope. That, that overrules and outshines any other thing that we could bring to people. So what can we do to be more effective as a church? Well, we started with week one with saying we need to have the right attitude uh, because if we have the right attitude, then people are attracted to that. They want to know why we have the attitude we have, why we have that outlook on life, and it gives us that chance, that open door then to tell them about the hope we have in Christ. So it begins with the right attitude. And then the next week we looked at uh, how we need to commit to attending uh, consistently uh, the assemblies of the church because we need to be equipped, we need to be trained, we need to be an encourager to others because we all go through struggles, we all get down from town, time to time. If we could be here for each other, part of that unity we're talking about, encouraging each other, holding each other accountable, we can be stronger as a church if we don't forsake the assemblies of the church family. Well then, last week we talked about uh, we need to be willing to uh, commit ourselves to studying God's Word faithfully. Uh, we cannot share what we don't know, what we don't have in our own minds, and our own hearts. So if we're going to share the hope of Jesus, then we need to be knowledgeable in his word and his message so that we can share that with other people. So another step we can take is to be consistently committed to being in the word on a daily basis. We need to be learning and growing in our knowledge and understanding of God's word. So we need to study his word faithfully. Today, we're going to add one more action step to how we can, as a church, be more effective and bring the hope of Jesus to the world, and that is that we will commit to serve willingly. I will serve willingly in the body of Christ, the church. One of the things, too, that I love about this church, not only the unity that we have, but I love the fact that we have hundreds of people week in and week out serving in the body of Christ here, willingly doing that as volunteers. And we've got a wonderful staff, paid staff, that serves and serves in great ways. And I'm thankful for the staff that we've got. But beyond that, hundreds of volunteers that are serving week in and week out in the body of Christ. There is this principle many of you have probably heard that 20% of the people do 80% of the work. Have you heard that? And that's true in a lot of places and in a lot of organizations. You know what? We shatter that percentage here at Lakeshore big time. We're well over 50, close to 60% as far as we can count of people that do 80% of the work, okay? So we're, we're way beyond the norm, way beyond the average. But it shouldn't be 50%, should it? It shouldn't be 60% because all of us are called to serve. So we want to grow toward that 100%. Everybody who claims the name of Christ, everybody who claims to be a disciple or a follower of Christ should, in that same vein of claiming that, be willing to say, that means, by nature, I am a servant. Because Jesus Christ said, I did not come to be served, but to serve. And our job as disciples is to grow up to be like Jesus. And if Jesus was a servant and we grow up to be like Jesus, then we will all be servants. Today I want us to look at excuses that I have made in my life sometimes, that I've heard others make as a pastor over and over again as to why they are not serving in the body of Christ. And then I want us to see why these excuses really don't stand up, okay? Why they really don't hold any weight. Uh, especially in the eyes of God and his church. The first one that I think is probably one of the most common ones, and by the way, if you've got your Bibles, this, I'm going to be looking especially at verses found in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. If you want to open up your Bibles there or your uh, Bible apps on your smartphones or tablets, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we'll put some of these verses up as we go through on, on the screen as well. The first excuse that I think probably is the most common one, I wanted to hit this one first, is the excuse of inadequacy. It was a very common excuse in Scripture, too. When I started looking at this and I started thinking about how people just sometimes feel inadequate to serve, I thought about the characters in the Bible that God called to service who used this excuse to try to get out of it. 
It, it was a common theme, even in Scripture, as you look back in history. When God called Moses to free the people from Egypt, you know what he said? I, 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 don't, I, I, I don't speak very, very, very well, 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 <laughs> right? I, I'm, not a good, I'm not a good orator, right? He, he used that excuse. I don't speak. Uh, I'm not a good speaker. So how in the world could I go before Pharaoh and, and represent the people before Pharaoh? And, and God said, who gave people the ability to speak, right? I mean, I can handle this, Moses. It's not a good excuse. When God called Gideon to lead his people against the Midianites, Gideon said to God, Who am I that I should lead my people? I'm the least of my family. My family is the least of the tribes in Manasseh. What gives me the right to go out and be a leader like that? He's thinking I'm inadequate because of my family situation. And there are people sitting here today that probably feel like, well, there are other people a lot more qualified than me. They are the ones that ought to be doing those service things, not me. I'm not really adequate for the job. I don't really have anything to offer. It's not that I don't want to serve. I do. I just don't feel like I'm qualified or equipped to serve. Well, Paul addresses that to the church at Corinth because a lot of them, I think, were struggling with the same thing or making an excuse Uh, to try to get out of serving. And he said in 1 Corinthians 12, beginning with verse 12, he likens the church to a body. Here's what he says. Just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all of its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were all given one spirit to drink. I love this idea of the church being uh, compared to like a human body with all the different parts of the human body. All the parts are different. They all serve a different purpose, a different role to function in. And, and what he's saying is, is that one part is no more important than the other. They all need to function for the body to be the strong body that God intended it to be. You're going to hear that theme all the way through the verses that we're going to be looking at here. But what we tend to do with, with uh, even the human body, but especially in the body of the church, is to think that, well, certain things, certain abilities, certain gifts are certainly more important, and they can accomplish a whole lot more than the others do. So uh, because of that, and I don't have that particular gift or ability or training or equipping, then my function in the body is not that big a deal. It's not going to accomplish a whole lot. So I'm not really even going to be able to contribute a whole lot. So why even try? And sometimes we want to excuse ourselves from serving at all because we feel like we're just not that important to the functioning of the body. Now, sometimes that's a lame excuse and we know it. We, we know we could serve and we're just not, we're looking for a way not to. But for some people, this is serious. They really don't feel like they could be used in any important way. Maybe something in your past, maybe something that that happened, maybe some failure in your life, maybe uh, some mistake that you've made makes you feel unqualified now to serve in the body of Christ. And, And to be honest, sometimes churches give that impression to people because of some past sin or failure in your life. You're kind of stained now, and you're kind of damaged goods now, and now you can't really be used in service in the kingdom. And friends, nothing could be further from the truth, scripturally speaking. Uh, Let me ask you something. Does the blood of Jesus cleanse us from all of our sins? Well, if it cleanses us, then the stain is removed, right? So now you can serve. I want you to see this little video clip. You may have seen this or something similar to this. It's been around a long time. But I thought this video did a good job of kind of putting it together. I want you to watch this. I really like that. Amen. (laughs) Throughout history, God has used very imperfect people. You know why? There weren't any other kind. There's still not any other kind. If he's going to do his work in the world, it has to be through flawed, imperfect people, just like us. But he is big enough and powerful enough to do that. One of the things he said in the passage we read here from 1 Corinthians is that we all have, we have all have been given the same spirit to drink. 
You see, it's God's spirit in us that equips us and empowers us to do what God wants us to do. And all of us who have come to Christ have been given the Holy Spirit as a gift from God. That's part of what happens to us when we are born into the kingdom. He gives us his spirit. And it is by his spirit that all of us can serve in some way that makes a difference in the kingdom. Because when all the parts are functioning the way they're supposed to, the whole body benefits. The whole body is stronger. The whole body is more effective and efficient. So yes, you have a place. You have a way that you can be used by God. Here's how amazing God is. God can not only use those who believe in Jesus, God has throughout history even used people who didn't believe in him, who were totally removed from him. Did you know that? Think about history. I want to give you a couple of examples. God used the king or the pharaoh of Egypt a couple of different times in history. One was with Joseph. Remember how he, Joseph was, was uh, used by God to rise up in the ranks in Egypt so that when there was a famine in the land, the Pharaoh had put Joseph in charge of his whole country and all of the crops to get ready for the famine. And, and God used that pagan king to save his own people. That's how powerful God is. Why do we get so scared when our candidate doesn't get elected? This could have come down the other side and other people would have been upset, right? And they would have been scared. Why do we get scared when man does something that we think is bad as if God is not bigger than that? Right? Think about that. God used a pagan leader. When uh, Nehemiah wanted to go back and rebuild the walls around Jerusalem, you know who helped him? A pagan ruler, King Artaxerxes. He wasn't a follower or believer in the one true God. He sent Nehemiah back to his homeland, and he didn't just send him there. He paid for him to go, and he didn't just pay his way there. He gave him all the supplies he needed to do the job. You see how God could use even somebody who doesn't believe in him at all or trust in his ways at all? It's amazing how God can do what he wants to do in spite of us and what we do or say. It just didn't just stop there. Think about... When Jesus was born, Rome is in power. The Caesar, Caesar Augustus, who was in charge, who, who was not a believer in, in God, who, was not, who, who worshipped idols, who, who had a pagan religion, this Caesar issues a decree that a census should be taken in all the world that Rome ruled at the time. So what was the big deal about that? God used him and used that census to get Mary and Joseph to what town? Bethlehem, that's not where they were living at the time. He got them to Bethlehem. Jesus is born while they're there. What did the prophecy say about where Jesus was going to be born? The Messiah was going to be born. He would be born where? In Bethlehem. He used a pagan leader to get his will done, to fulfill prophecy. Isn't that amazing? That's how big our God is. Why, Why should we live in fear at any time? When we know God has that kind of power and control and rule, over all things. Even after that, when the early church was getting started, you know what the early church did? They had a tendency like us in the church today. They liked to stay comfortable. And because they liked comfort, they weren't spreading the gospel the way they needed to. And I'm not saying God caused this to happen, but he used it for his purposes. Uh, The Roman government and some of the Jewish leaders began to persecute the church. And you know what happened to the church? They had to scatter. You know what they took with them when they scattered? The gospel. They took it all over the world, and they turned the world upside down for Jesus. Even persecution God used for his plan and for his purposes. What have we got to be afraid of, people? We have every reason to have full confidence in God, and that God can use us, and he can use anyone for his plan and his purposes. He is over all authorities, all rulers in all the world, and God can use Anyone and everyone. And sometimes even without their permission. Often without their permission. That's why the perfect love of God drives fear out of our lives. And your fear of being used by God in service can be driven away by the fact that you need to know how much God loves you. He's put his spirit in you and he's called you to serve. And you don't have to be afraid to step up and serve a God like that. He will. He will be with you.
in your service. Well, the second excuse we often use is the excuse of indecision. I don't think we decide to be indecisive because that would make us decisive, right? But (laughs) think about that one for a minute. But anyway, indecision is our enemy. What a lot of Christians do, I think, a lot of church members do, is is we start thinking about, well, yeah, I know I need to serve, and I just got to figure out the right place and the right time and the right thing, the right opportunity. Uh, I don't want to do, you know, something I don't need to be doing. I don't want to, uh, you know, try. I don't think I'd like that one or that one. So I've got to wait until I feel like it's right for me to do that particular thing at that particular time. There's a book that came out years ago that introduced a concept that, that I really liked. It has changed my thinking on servanthood. It's by Richard Foster, and it says this. There's a difference between choosing to serve and choosing to be a servant. When I choose to serve, I retain control about who I serve and when I serve. But when I choose to be a servant, I've given up all rights and all control. I like the difference. Do you catch the difference there between choosing to serve and choosing to be a servant? Those are two different things. What he's saying is if I choose to serve, then you might just say, all right, I'll sign up to go help out at the workday at church on Saturday at 10 o'clock because that works into my schedule okay. Uh, That's something I figure I can work around and do that one day. And so I'll go serve at that particular time and that particular place. But when you choose to be a servant, it's a lifestyle now. And whatever happens to come up, whatever God presents to you along the way, because you're a servant, guess what you do? You serve. You do it. I was raised by uh, parents that had me go to work for a man early on in life that, that taught me this idea of service. Even though he wasn't doing it as a pastor, he wasn't doing it as a part of the church, he just taught me that I should, as a human being, serve others. And one of the things he, he required of us was that if we were anywhere and saw paper on the ground, we had to pick it up and put it in the trash can. That's just was expected of us. We didn't walk past it and say, somebody else ought to get that. We were supposed to do that. Now, I did it first out of fear of that guy. Because he would come down hard on us if we walked past that paper and didn't pick it up. But you know what he trained me to do? He trained me to think that way. Even today, when I come up in the church property here, I will pick up paper on the way in the door. And I know people have sometimes left it out there. Sometimes it's just blown from another property. In our, it doesn't matter. And I know we have people that we pay to come clean our property. We do. We have people that are getting paid to do that. And that's the attitude we sometimes have. Well, people get paid to do that. I don't need to do that. Right? And it's just habit for me now. I see paper. I can't leave it. I have to stop. My wife gets frustrated sometimes because she's ready to go somewhere, getting in the car, and I stop and pick up paper. You know. Here's the thing. I didn't realize it, but I was being trained to be a servant. I wasn't conscious of it at the time, but that's what was happening. And it paid off down the road because that's just more now my nature Even though it was forced on me at first, it became my nature just to do that. Now, that's just one little example. But all around us every day, if we're looking as a servant at the life around us, at people around us, at situations around us, if we are consciously thinking like a servant, we will see opportunities to serve all around us all the time. And I know we can't do everything, but, but here's the problem with that attitude. We can't do everything. What we do with that is say, then let's not do anything, right? Because you can't do everything. So we end up not doing anything. But if you're a servant at heart, then as those opportunities present themselves, the natural response is just going to be just do what you can at the time with the opportunity you have in front of you. You say it may not change the world. No, but it'll change the world for that one person that you just helped. It'll change their world, right? It'll change the... the, uh, uh, if ability of the church to impact the world, if all of us are doing little acts of service every day, think about multiplying that hundreds of times over how that can impact our community and our culture and our world. One little thing by itself you don't think is too big, but you multiply that hundreds of times over, yeah, that does have a huge impact on our culture, on our world. So we need to know that 
that we've got to not be indecisive about this. We have to determine either we're servants or we're not. In 1 Corinthians 12, he goes on in verse 14 to say, Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. Now, if the foot should say, Because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. And if the ear should say, Because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. In other words, just because you can't decide where you fit in doesn't make you any less a part of the body. So just serve while you can, where you can, where you are right now, any way that you can. Now, it's true that, that you have certain gifts and abilities that may be better used in certain areas of service. And that's good to search that out and find that place where it's really a good fit for you. But just serve where you are in the meantime. Just be serving anyway. I... Uh, I've talked about this before, and it still happens occasionally. It happened just the other day where I'm here at the building during the week a lot with office hours here, and we have people that, that, that work on the facilities here and, and keep it up and everything, and they do a great job, but occasionally something goes wrong and they're not here. And, and uh, just the other day again, we've got PDO going on, and there's a toilet stopped up, and everybody needs to use bathrooms while they're here, right? And, and our regular maintenance people weren't here right at that exact moment. So guess what? There's a plunger in the bathroom. Guess what you're supposed to do if there's a plunger in the bathroom? And you, you may not have a degree in it, but if you can operate a plunger, if you can operate a plunger, what should you do? Pick up a plunger and try to unstop the toilet, right? So I'm in there plunging the toilet. And senior pastor of the church plunges toilet. It won't make the news anywhere, right? But I don't feel like that's my gift or calling. Okay, I don't want everybody calling on me for that, okay? But if there's a toilet stopped up and you're there and you have a chance of maybe helping, just help, just serve, just do whatever needs to be done at the time, right? That might w make the world a little better. Believe me, an unstopped toilet makes the world better. <laughs> it really does, especially with our kids here at church. So let's stop making the excuse of indecision. I just haven't decided yet where the best place for me to serve is. And sometimes I'll say, Pastor Randy, where do you need help at at the church? <laughs> and I love it when people ask that. And I always tell them, you can name any area of ministry and we need help. So just jump in there anywhere. I'll help connect you wherever you can help. Let's do it. Now, if you don't want me to do that, don't ask me. But if you want me to do that, ask me. Well, then number three, the third excuse is this, the excuse of indifference. And sadly, I think this is more common than anybody wants to admit, is we simply don't care enough to serve. We say we do. We say we love God and we love others. We know those are the two greatest commandments. But to love God and to love others means to serve. That, that's, what, that's how you live that out. That's how that's defined is by serving. Remember, Jesus served, and if we love him and want to be like him and honor him, then we need to serve too. Look at what he says in verse 17. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts but one body. And kind of the point of what he's making, the theme that is ongoing through all of this is this. The body is designed by God exactly the way he wants it to be. He has designed you. I, I love uh, my wife's, one of her favorite passages is how God knit us together. We're, we're fearfully and wonderfully made uh, by God himself. We are all made by God exactly the way we are. But he did that with a plan and a purpose for how he can use us to do the good things he wants to have done here on this earth. So if we understand that, if we understand that we are part of God's plan, and, and part of that plan means we're connected to others in the church, and the church is called to serve, then we can't be indifferent about this. We can't go through life saying it doesn't matter if I do this or not. Uh, this is not a big deal to me. This is not important to me. It's important to God. It's important to his son Jesus who died for you on the cross. That means it should be important to us too. We can't be indifferent about this. This is something that should be a driving force of our lives. This desire to be a servant. To live like a servant. Maybe you heard about the church. You had a number of church members with quite unusual names. 
four of them were quite unusual. It was everybody, somebody, anybody, and nobody. One day there was an important job that was going to be done in the church. Everybody was sure somebody would do it. Now, anybody could have done it, but nobody did it. And when nobody did it, everybody got mad because it was anybody's job. Everybody thought that somebody would do it, but nobody did it. So consequently, everybody blamed somebody when nobody did what anybody could have done. <laughs> I had to write that down. There's no way I could have gotten that out. <laughs> we can't be indifferent and just say, oh, I'm sure somebody will take care of it. Well, you're that somebody. If you have opportunity and ability and resources and, 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 and a chance to be used by God, then maybe he's, he's determined you're the one that's supposed to do that. I still have fun as a pastor when people come to me with ideas that ministries to church ought to be doing. I don't know why the church doesn't have this. The church ought to be doing that. And I always tell them, well, uh, we, we try to do things that fit into the connect, grow, and serve thing. And if that fits into that, then, yeah, we need to try to do that. So when would you like to start? Maybe the fact that it concerns you is God saying to you, you need to be one of those people that takes care of this, that's doing that. It's easy to say somebody ought to be doing this. Well, you are somebody in the body of Christ. So let's look for those opportunities and let's see how God could use us. We have to care enough. That's really the bottom line. A servant knows that life is not all about them. A servant understands that in order to do what you're called to do as a servant, it's going to be inconvenient at times. It's going to be hard. It's going to cost something. It's going to require something of us. We're going to have to get out of our comfort zones to be a servant. We have to. There's no other way to serve. And so it comes down to, again, what we started with in this whole series, having the right attitude, having the right frame of mind, way of thinking, approach to life. Philippians chapter 2 has the greatest teaching on this. In Philippians 2, beginning with verse 1, and I don't know if we've got this one to put on the screen or not, but I just want to share it with you again. Here's, here's what it says. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from His love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, in other words, if you've been blessed or benefit any way at all by knowing Christ as your Lord and Savior, all right? Can we all agree we have benefit from knowing Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior? Yeah, absolutely, okay? So he says, if you have that, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind, do nothing out of, what is that, selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Wait just a minute, Jesus. That means I have to value others more than my own comfort, my own, my own getting my own way, my own... Having what I want when I want it. Yes, that's what he's saying. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interest of the others. Wow. Be outward focused. Don't make life all about you. Make it about how you can serve other people. And then he adds... In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. He took away every excuse we ever had right there. He said, I want you to have the same approach to life that Jesus Christ had to life. Why? Because we claim to be followers of Christ. We claim to be disciples of Christ. That means we're supposed to live with the mindset and the attitude that Christ had. Well, what kind of mindset did Christ have? He tells us here. Verse 6, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant. Wow. Being made in human likeness, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. 
Therefore God exalted him to the highest place, gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Have this same attitude, mindset, approach to life that Jesus had. Jesus humbled himself and became an obedient servant even when it cost him everything, even his own life. We can't be indifferent to this. We need to think like Jesus, act like Jesus. We need to serve like Jesus. And it requires nothing less than total surrender and sacrifice of self. That's what we're called to. Total surrender and sacrifice of self. So that we can serve others after the example of our teacher, Jesus. Well, there's one more excuse I wanted us to touch on today that doesn't stand up scripturally. And that's the excuse of insignificance. I already touched on it a little bit, but I want you to look again at 1 Corinthians 12. Let's look at verse 21. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. The head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable, and the parts that we think are less honorable we treat with special honor. The parts that are unpresentable uh, are treated with special modesty, while our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is part of it. When people come to a church sometimes, uh, here in Nashville we see kind of this side of it a little bit. We have a lot of musicians who move to the area, right? Singers, songwriters, musicians. They'll move to Nashville wanting to make it in the music business. Many of them are Christians. But many of them began to look for a church. And one of the criteria they look for in a church, one of the things they look for is an opportunity to use their gifts and abilities in music, which is great. Uh, and most of them have the right attitude about it. They just want to use it in service in the body of Christ. And we're blessed with a lot of those people here at Lakeshore. And I'm so thankful for them. So grateful for them. But once in a while, we get one or two that come along, and what they want is not an opportunity to serve. They want an opportunity to perform and get attention, to build their careers, to be able to make it in the business. And it doesn't take long for that to come out. They're the first ones to get upset if you don't feature them on the stage regularly, right? And here's the problem. A lot of us, we want to serve as long as we're getting the attention and the praise and the recognition for what we're doing. And we think that it ought to be that way because, after all, look at Pastor Randy. He's on the stage all the time, and the lights are always on Pastor Randy. And, man, you know, it must be great to be in that place where you're getting all that attention and all that praise for serving. Uh, spend the week with me one week, by the way. But... Uh, It's not all the lights on the stage when you're serving as a pastor of a church. And I, I know that. I knew it going into it. And I have to accept the other part with that part. It's just going to be that way. But he's saying, just because you're not an eye or an ear or some feature of the body that gets the recognition or everybody sees it or everybody knows about, doesn't mean your role is any less important to God or to the kingdom or to making a difference in the world. We have hundreds of volunteers here week in and week out. Today we get to open up a bookstore here at Lakeshore. Isn't that great? I love that. Yeah. <laughs> Believe it or not, it did not just magically appear out there. Rick Desmond, his wife Debbie, and our son Bobby worked with them. They all worked hard to get this put together. Other people helped too and contributed to it. They serve behind the scenes, getting everything ready. What you're going to see is the bookstore today. 
and it looks good, and it's going to be a real blessing. But that could not be there had people not been serving behind the scenes. You came in and enjoyed great praise music today, didn't you? Amen. Guess what these people did? They practiced for hours to get ready to present that music, to lead us in worship today. You don't see that part. But it has to be done for the other to happen. You just had communion around the Lord's table. Believe it or not, God could do it, but he didn't miraculously just put the bread and the juice out here for us and fill up all those cups and all those trays. We had people behind the scenes giving time and energy and effort to making sure that was done. While we've been in here enjoying this time together in praise and worship, we've got volunteers in the back right now loving on our kids teaching them, instructing them, letting them feel the love of God through their care. People that do that week in and week out every week here at Lakeshore. We've got people that during the week will serve at the food pantry at the branch of Nashville and serve at the uh, English classes to help refugees learn English to get better jobs. You don't see that. It's not featured here on Sundays, but it's going on week after week after week, serving in the community and the body of Christ. I could list more and more and more. Small groups meeting in homes, inviting their neighbors to come learn together with them, praying for each other, serving each other. It happens week in and week out here at Lakeshore. Hundreds of people serving. And some people complain, uh, I have to do too much. Not enough people are serving here. Friends, you don't know half of what people are doing around here in the kingdom of God. You know why? They're not doing it for recognition or praise, and they don't expect that. They're just quietly being servants in the body of Christ. And you know what I know? I know that God is using all of that service to make huge impact in the world. People are coming to know the love of God. They're finding Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Marriages are being healed. Children are being brought to Christ. There's so much good happening week in and week out daily. daily. And because of the service of people who are serving here as a part of our church family. And the impact is spreading and spreading and spreading, not just here in this community, but all over the world through the service of the people here. And we want to invite you to come and be a part of that. If I didn't cover your excuse today, let me know what it is. I bet there's a scriptural answer to it. You can take the steps today to come and give yourself to Christ, to follow after him as a servant. And we invite you as we stand and sing today to come and to serve.